My name is Benjamin Moultrie Grant, and this is my story. <laughs> so my story actually starts from before I was born. I tell people a lot of times it's, it's a blessing to just be alive and have life, uh, because life is a blessing. Every day is, is a gift. And my story begins before I was born with my parents. My mom is born and raised in England, um, and she took a big risk when she was 18 to pack up everything and fly across the Atlantic and come move to the Bahamas where she didn't really know anyone or know anything. And she just set up a life here uh, uh, since she's been 18. And my dad, similar, he was born and raised in Jamaica from like very humble beginnings, uh, from a family where family was everything. And he just worked really hard to pursue his dream, which was to, to become a veterinarian. And he worked hard. He, through faith, had the opportunity to go to school in the U.S. to get a degree. And one day just saw a job posting in the Bahamas to, to come and work. And he's been there ever since. So both of my parents were kind of two ends of the world coming together in the Bahamas and settling. And they had been there for a while. And it's crazy because my mom had told me, like, many doctors told her that she couldn't have kids. Uh, so me just being born in the first place was a blessing uh, because I think three different doctors said there was no chance that, that she could have any kids. So, I mean, I, to her, am a huge blessing that I, I could have been born and, you know, I'm thankful for being able to be alive and thankful for her and my family for what they always provided for me. Uh, but I guess I've always been beating the odds from conception, I guess. Uh, I grew up in a pretty normal, well, I guess not really too much of a normal family. Uh, my parents were never married. They were always just friends. Uh, and they kind of co-parented me throughout my process of growing up. And it was actually really good uh, because I was able to have a relationship with both of them in, in a very beneficial way. There was no negativity. I got to see both of them. I got to learn from both of them. And I really was fortunate to have two really loving parents who cared about me a lot and always invested in me, like always, always poured in love and care towards me. Uh, but growing up, I always knew that I, I never really fit a certain bill or model of, of any other kid. You know, like my mom is white, long blonde hair, my dad is black, one from England, one from Jamaica, but I came out looking like a light-skinned Asian kid, like a Buddha, you know? It was just like a weird fit in the middle. So I never really fit the bill of, of anything. I was always different, always stood out. But I always looked at that as a blessing. You know, I never let uh, my difference be something that was a, a limitation. I always looked at it as an opportunity to do something new, uh, to stand out. And growing up, my parents, my, my grandparents, my aunts, my uncles, everybody I know really just was always investing in me and, and pouring love into me and support. Uh, but it definitely wasn't like a, an easy process. Like growing up as the only child, there was a lot of times where I was just alone. Uh, I, I didn't really have much and that made me like a very, very introverted kid. And it's crazy, I tell people now that I'm like an introvert and they don't believe me, but people could tell you like growing up, I was just a, a quiet kid. I didn't really talk too much. And when I did talk, I was very monotone. Uh, no dy dynamics in my voice, no real bubbly, outgoing personality. I was just chill and calm. And I had the opportunity to make some really good friends when I was uh, in primary school. And I'm really thankful for them because they kind of set the uh, the, the guidelines on what relationships meant and the role of people. And like I have a group now of like 20 friends who most of them I've known since I was five, six, seven years old. And to me, they have been my family and they've been the people who have given me the support and given me the, the comfortability to step out and be myself. But growing up, there really wasn't too much special about me. You know, I tried to do good in school. I tried to get involved. I was in scouts. I was in Kiwanis. I was in like writing clubs, but never really was anything special. And then when I got to high school, uh, I went to this camp in the Bahamas, Camp Bahamas. And growing up, I had always heard about God. I'd always gone to church, but to me, it just was like, you know, I'm gooder, you know, a better person than other people. I guess I'll go to heaven. I know gooder isn't a word, but you know, you understand. Like, it was always just a comparison thing. Am I more good than this person? Am I less bad than this person? And I always thought that, you know, I guess I'd go to heaven because better than someone else, I guess. And when I went to this camp in Camp Bahamas, uh, that was the first time I'd heard this gospel and understood that 
the rules of everything were a bit different, that it wasn't really about being a good person. It was about something much bigger. It was about faith and it was about salvation through God. And it was a really interesting concept. Like, I really enjoyed it. Uh, but I went back and really just went back to living my life normally. There was no change. Maybe I read my Bible a little bit more, but I was no different of a person. There was no transformation that existed. But the next summer, everything changed. Uh, I was 14 at the time, and I went to camp uh, in Jamaica, uh, where my dad is from. And there was this place called Moreland's Camp. And it was during that one week that I had seen the presence of God manifested in real life in a way that I had never seen before. I remember the very first day of the trip, I had a dream that there was this huge wind just coming over the, the campus of where we were and that like the presence of something was just existing. And throughout the week, like I kid you not, I was seeing miracles happening left and right. Like I saw kids with their legs messed up start walking. I saw people who had scoliosis, like having their backs just straightened out through prayer. I'd seen all this love, all this energy. I'd seen these people have like, someone had an asthma attack and like had this crazy thing where they were just like, it just stopped through these amazing works of God. And throughout all this, like, you know, you doubt, uh, you see crazy things happen and you think there's no way that could be real. You know, that's just a coincidence. And then it was on the last day of the camp, after I'd seen all of this happen, that I had my own encounter for myself. And I remember I was praying uh, and just kind of worshiping God. And I had felt the tangible presence of God like touch me, you know, and, and I felt it. You know, it was something I could, cannot explain with any like human description or emotion, but it was just this overwhelming feeling of love, like something I could not express. It was in one moment, that I just felt overwhelmed with the love of God. And I heard God say two things to me. One, that I love you. And two, that your purpose here is to spread the good news to the ends of the world. And it was at that moment that I realized what my purpose being on earth was. It wasn't about reaching any title. It wasn't about being a good person. It was about loving and loving for God and loving unconditionally and spreading that message of love to anybody and everybody. And I remember after I had that moment, I was sitting out just looking at life and I could feel this peace and this unison with a creator who intentionally lined up the world. And I could almost feel the power of that creator inside of me. And it was crazy because that moment changed everything in my life. Like that was the moment that I really went from being an introverted person to an extroverted person. Like, People could tell you, at that camp afterwards, I was running around, smiling, talking to everybody. Every single person knew me just because I didn't care anymore about what anybody had to say about me or what anyone's opinion was. What I cared about most was just loving people and sharing positivity. And I spoke to uh, one of the, the people who, who was a missionary visiting for that camp. And he spoke to me and he really like prophesied over my life and said that uh, I would do 10 times the amount of miracles that he would do. And that was a crazy thing for me because I was looking at this person who had done really insane stuff and I was like, there's no way I could do that. But at the same time, I had the belief and the faith that maybe I could. And to me, a miracle isn't necessarily uh, uh, healing somebody or, or watching the water spread open and creating a path out of nothing. For me, a miracle is just seeing somebody who is in the darkness come to light or seeing someone who doesn't have hope, have hope and have faith. Uh, and, you know, I always tell people, you know, I'm not the biggest of, of people. Most people can probably beat me in a fight, like, pretty easily, I would say. You know, I'm not this person who's walking around six foot five, jacked in the gym. I'm just a, a simple guy. You know, you can see it. Like, it's nothing real special to me. You know, I don't brag about any personal strength or confidence. But mentally, I think I have more courage than 99% of people not because of anything that I'm putting in myself, but because I have the faith that, that God can use me to do things that the world would say are impossible. So I always bet on myself because I know who's in my corner and I know who's fighting for me. So there's people out there who, who may have all of this pride and, and this external confidence, but they're probably too scared to write a blog or talk to people or start a business or send their grandmother a nice message, you know, or love their enemy. But I, I don't see any of those things as a boundary. I think 
there are no rules, there are no lines, and I have the power that's within me that gives me the confidence to do anything. So I left this camp and I went back home to the Bahamas and now it was like go time. I was like, shoot, I am energized. I have this great spirit in me. It's time to go let these people know about this good truth that sent me. So I just went out just talking to everybody. I was involved in youth groups. I was involved in, in school clubs. I had all this zeal and energy, but I had to refine it. You know, so even though I was energetic, I still took the time to study and just learn about this word, learn about the scriptures, talk, learn about these things that were so important to me. Uh, and I had realized that I had this passion, I had this truth to talk about, but I wasn't really a public speaker. You know, I wasn't really historically anybody who had the, the capabilities to engage groups of people. But I think the same way that God could take David and, and use him to slay Goliath or take Moses who had killed someone and was scared to, to free the people of Egypt or, or take Jesus who was praying in the garden saying, God, please take this cup away from me. You know, I think God called me to be a light and to be an influence at that point in time. So it was having the, the courage and faith on my end to, to accept that and to have the faith that God could use me for great things. So I took the stand and I got involved. I started speaking in youth groups. I started getting involved. You know, I was, I was like, a, like a seed just being planted and knowing that whatever situation I was in, I had to have the faith to water the opportunity that God gave me. And after all these opportunities, I uh, eventually started really seeing God be able to move. I had the opportunity to, to be on the Youth Zone, uh, which was a television show back in the Bahamas. You know, when I first heard about, about it, I was like, I don't know if I should do this. But I took it again as an opportunity and I followed up on it and eventually had the opportunity to co-host it. You know, I had a, a national audience to share my opinion on issues. And that was really, again, my platform to be a light for God and, and for Christian values. And when I say Christian values, I just mean love at the end of the day. And I remember there's one thing in particular where I'd seen God work a couple of ways. I was like 15 years old and I told my parents, I was like, you know, drop me off at the shopping plaza because uh, I want to go pray for people. They were like, what? <laughs> but they were like, okay, so my dad dropped me off and I literally just went around the whole place, just stopping every single person I saw and said, hey, can I pray for you? And some people brushed me off. They were like, what are you doing? They, you know, just dismissed me and let me go. But I didn't let the fear of failure deter me from loving the next person. I just kept going. Someone rejects me, so what? Move on. Someone accepts it, so what? Move on. I don't let the approval of others, the approval of others deter the mission that I'm called to do. And by the end of it, I was brought to the back room of some offices to pray for the whole staff. I had some people stop me crying and saying that they were looking for a sign from God and that this was a huge blessing to them. I was seeing people receive like tons of encouragement and blessings that if I allowed that first rejection to determine the next steps, I would have never been able to do. And it's all about continuing to walk in faith and not be deterred by the, the ways of the world to understand the calling and, and be committed to it. Someone said to me the other day, the door that is leading to your happiness is the same door that's gonna give you that fear of rejection. And it's all about walking through that door. And I think that's what God gives us the faith to walk through that door. And again, another time, I remember I was in my school student Christian movement and we were doing school assembly one day and the president came to me and she said, uh, Benjamin, I want you to prepare like a wrap up prayer for when we're done uh, with the presentation. So I went home and I was preparing, thinking about what I wanted to pray about. And I was like in the word of God and I just felt like God speaking to me and saying like, like showing me that I was talking in front of everybody at assembly. And, and when I was up there, it was like a very nervous feeling, but was, I almost had this vision of God being with me and Him speaking, not necessarily me speaking. So in my mind, I was walking through that moment, like, like spiritually. And then the next day I go to school in the morning and the uh, president comes up to me and she says, Benjamin, uh, so we were gonna play a video and do something, but uh, it didn't work out, so we need you to, to speak during assembly. So I was like, so I need, a, I need a talk? So I went to one of my teachers and asked them for some advice. I went to assembly. She spoke for literally like 10 seconds. She literally went up and was like, hey, this is uh, what we're doing today, and we're gonna bring up Benjamin to talk. So now I have 15 minutes to go and talk in front of the entire school. And it was the exact same thing spiritually that I was seeing the day before. 
but I was prepared for it because I knew it wouldn't be about what I was saying, but it was about God using me as a vessel for Him to speak to everyone else. So that was this crazy opportunity of me being a light to the entire school, like thousands of people for God. And it wasn't anything that I was doing, but it was me having the faith that God could use me for something great like that. And time went on and I just really in my life seen God move in faith again and again and again, doing miracle after miracle after miracle. Like even school, I didn't want to go to college. I wanted to just go off and be a missionary somewhere. But again, sometimes God calls you to things, like literally calls you against your will sometimes. Because I, like I said, I did not want to go to school. If anything, I wanted to go to a Bible college. I didn't have the money for college. I didn't have the interest for it. But I was at school one day and, and someone came to me and said, hey, Benjamin, uh, do you know Liberty University? And I was like, yeah, I've heard of it. I'm probably going to apply, but it's not like a place I necessarily want to go. They said, well, there's this uh, scholarship contest that one of my counselors told me about. You should probably go apply for it. So I go and I look at this scholarship and it's a full scholarship. And all you have to do is just write an essay and send in the application. So I go home and write the best essay I can possibly write uh, and fill out my application. And again, thanks to God, I won it. And it was a full scholarship, full tuition. And again, literally out of nothing, God presented me with this opportunity to, to, to advance myself and be what He needed me to be in that specific moment. And obviously in the time, you don't see it, but looking back, I can see how it was His work aligning everything. So that happened and I was gassed. I was pumped. I was like, let's go. I have the next four years settled. I don't have to worry about anything. And it, again, taught me like a side note, something important, like being in high school and having college sorted out is this really good feeling because teachers can't say anything to you because nothing matters anymore. What, you, you're gonna fail me for homework? Doesn't matter, I'm in college already. Like, didn't do my coursework, so what? I'm in college. Like, everything that I'm living in high school for, I have already secured. So this time here really was just for fun. So I was just having fun at the end of high school. But that's just like a shorter thing of showing you like in life, it's the same thing. Uh, everybody cares about these physical, tangible things in life to try and get to some goal, but Really, if you're seeing it past your time on earth and you have a, a heaven mentality, nothing on earth really matters because you already have the security. You already have the blessing of something much greater than, than what this world has to offer. So aside from that side note, I, uh, I came to school and I was like, what am I going to do with my time here? You know, I have, during my time here at school, just had the amazing opportunity to do tons of things just because of acts of faith. I helped work on a campaign to bring tons of Bahamian students to Liberty. I ran a hurricane fundraiser that brought toys back to kids in the Bahamas. I started a Caribbean Student Association. I worked on a dance ministry team. I worked in like four different departments. I started a nonprofit. I was involved in school in the Center for Entrepreneurship, through student government, through elections. Like I have done so much while I've been here. And really behind that, I am not that special of a person. I'm just a normal guy. You know, I have insecurities and failures like anybody else, but I am driven by that thought at night, by that imagination which says I can be anything, by the Spirit of God calling me to do great things. That's what I let direct me. Not fear, not anxiety, not worry. I let God be the compass direct in my life. And He has used me during my time in school to do things that I couldn't have even imagined to do. But behind that, with my education, I had thought to myself, you know, what do I want to study? And I really took the wrong mentality, or I guess looking back at it, maybe it was the right mentality of aiming for the highest goal I could possibly reach for. I said, you know, if I'm going to be here in school, I want to set my goal as high as I possibly can. And what's the, what's the highest thing? And I thought about it and I was like, well, you know, maybe being the leader of some international organization or, or being the top of government or international relations, that's, that's probably the, the biggest goal I could aspire towards. So I remember it, like I had this clear vision. I was like, this is what I wanna to work towards. I wanna to make it to the top. And I worked hard towards that. I studied it, I was immersed in it. I took it up as my free time. I had the opportunity to go to Washington DC and, and intern at an amazing think tank. I was getting involved with political leaders. I started a nonprofit. I was getting positioned to be exactly where I needed to be to work up in this career of international relations. And through studying it, like I was learning so much about how to give back and how to be an influential person. 
But I had this interesting moment throughout 2019 where I went through this deconstruction and reconstruction. And I found myself in 2019, having just coming back from my internship in DC, having a lot of money, having accomplished a lot of things, having a lot of success, a lot of, of notoriety. And I really just wasted it all. You know, I spent time and just spent my money on whatever. Like I, I became prideful about a lot of the things I was doing. I wasn't stewarding the blessings uh, that God had given to me. And it really just kind of all crumbled under, under beneath me. I remember there's this one moment in March, I think, or even April, I don't know, where I was standing on top of this roof of the building one day, I think it was like a Wednesday or Thursday. And that week I had been fired from my job. I had basically had to stop my nonprofit work because it, it just was failing. I had a whole team that I was working with that was a project that just fell apart. I had to leave from entrepreneurship programs. I had my, my team at the Caribbean Student Association announce their resignment, largely because of my failed leadership. I was sick. I was failing classes. I didn't know if I would continue in school. Like literally everything was falling apart. And behind all of that, I was asking myself, you know, I'm doing all of this stuff. Why am I doing it? I felt like I was doing it because I had to do it. And if I didn't do it, you know, who would do it? But I also wasn't living true and I wasn't following my heart and I wasn't following the, the intention that God was putting on me. I was trying to kind of build myself up and hold myself up with me. And I realized just how weak I am. You know, everything was at that point falling apart, but at the same time, I knew not to worry because life is like a wave. Like a, some scientists call it like undulation is the concept of up and down and up and down and up and down. And Winston Churchill has a quote saying, success is moving from failure to failure and not losing the motivation. So I knew even though I was at that low point, even though I was facing all of this failure, all of this disappointment, I knew that God still had, had a bigger plan behind it. And in that moment, I had forsaken God. Like I wasn't giving him the priority that he needed. I wasn't letting him direct my steps, but I needed to go through that negative fall to return me to where I needed to be. And after that, I wasn't necessarily restored with my relationship with God, but I understood that I am like a clay pot, that God is gonna use me and mold me and shape me and sometimes put me through the fire in order to be what he eventually needs me to be in the daily. So I, I made this crazy decision. I was like, I'm gonna shave my head bald. And that was like for a lot of different reasons. Uh, and most people remember that. But what that taught me more than anything was not to do anything for other people's opinion. Not to let what someone else thinks about you dictate what you want to do. And it was this time of just happiness where I really wasn't caring about what anyone thought. I was just doing things for me. I'd reconnected a lot spiritually, but I was studying a lot of different stuff, a lot of different other religions, just to learn and glean things from what, what they were teaching. You know, Taoism, Rastafarianism, Hinduism, all the other spiritualities. And they were teaching me so much and, and helping me kind of restore my humility and peace with the earth and, and kind of reshaping my relationship with God. But as time went on, there was one real significant moment which brought me right back to where I needed to be. Uh, and that was Hurricane Dorian. And I remember I was in school and I saw the news of Dorian happening and I was like, wow, like this is crazy. And I was like, well, what, what do I do? How do I respond to this? And I was in this point in time where I really began appreciating what God was doing more in my life and I was seeing him move. But, you know, I, I looked at the opportunities my school had and said, you know, I, I'd rather give the opportunity to the younger kids. I'd rather let the freshman and the sophomore have the opportunity to to take up this chance of giving back. And my school had the opportunity to do this relief trip where we were sending people back to the Bahamas uh, to work in Abaco and, and do some restoration work. And I said, you know, I'll give the opportunity to someone else. I don't know if I want to do it. Uh, but I understood again that it wasn't really about my will. It's about seeing the opportunities form as God creates them and understanding what he has called me to be. And even though I don't want to be a leader, even though I don't want to be a servant, even though I don't want to take a stand in, 
and, and love people, that's where I know the most joy comes from. That's where I know the most glorification and sanctification and restoration comes from. And I know that's exactly what I am called to do. So I decided to go. Thankfully, I had the opportunity to be invited to go. And while I was there, that was when my relationship with God was really restored. It was amongst seeing the devastation, seeing the destruction, but still seeing the hope, seeing the love that people had, that I realized that life is simple. Nobody is the same. You know, some people have a lot, some people have a little, but you just have to be thankful for what you have. And above anything, you have to abide in God. And it's when you abide in Him, when you, you don't rely on yourself, but you spend time in a relationship with Him, with the force that holds the world together, that's when His love, His forgiveness can really touch you. And then you can really move to love and forgive others. So I worked throughout that week, but that really was the beginning of, of change. I came back, Kanye West just dropped his new album. I was pumped. I was listening to every song. I was reading my Bible every single day. I was focused. I was looking at how I could love someone else. And I really was just taking every single opportunity to work towards the kingdom of God behind closed doors within my own heart. And I took time to fast for 40 days from spending time with people for no reason because I was wasting my time just socializing. I just spent time just focused, reading the word, studying what God had in store for me. I knew that 2020 was going to be a big year. I mean, I believe that this is the beginning of an amazing decade and just life in general. But I knew for me, this would be the year that I graduate college. It'd be the year that I move back to the Bahamas. It'd be the year that I start my career. It'd be the year that I launch a brand. It'd be the year that I begin defining who I really am as a person. And I want it to be known that going into this new year in 2020, that it's not about Benjamin. That guy's dead and gone. What matters is God. And anything that I do from 2020 onwards, I wanted to be part of that public ministry of glorifying God and putting His name on the map. Because He's been the person who's formed my life thus far. And for me to turn my back on Him and start living for me, cap, that don't make no sense. I could just end up back where I was a couple months ago, hurt and pain, depressed. But it's His love and His yoke that I lean upon that gives me the restoration and the faith and the empowerment that I really need. And it was in end of 2020, sorry, in the end of 2019 when I was reading my Bible so much that I really was becoming aware of new truths that were closed for so long, that were hidden right in the text. And it comes right back to the beginning in the Garden of Eden. And God says that there's two trees. There's a tree of life and there's a tree of good and evil. The knowledge of good and evil, to be specific. And man was in the garden living peacefully with God. But Adam and Eve took the step to to eat from the knowledge of the tree and good and evil. And it's when they ate from that tree that they realized they were naked. Now, I really want to stress, like, this tree is the knowledge of good and evil. This one is life. They would seem like they're the same thing, but they're really very different. You see how I talked about, like, that wave, that undulation pattern of life? That is the essence of life in the beginning. When God formed the world, First thing he did was separate the darkness from the light. In Taoism, they call it the Tao, you know, the the yin-yang symbol. Because for there to be life, there first must be a division. And when there's that division, then you have choice. So us as people, we don't have free will if there is no essence of divide, if there is no option. So that's the fundamental thing. But when you live through the knowledge of good and evil, then you're looking at life through the lens of that balance. And when you look at life through the ups and downs, you realize that there is a lot of good things in life, but there's also a lot of bad things. And you're gonna choose to try and be a good person because why why would you wanna be evil? You may choose to be evil, but like regardless, you're gonna suffer a lot of pain. No matter how big and strong you are, you're still gonna have insecurities. No matter how successful you are, you're still gonna have hurt and pain. No matter how happy your family is, there's still gonna be tragedies. So no amount of good can break you out of the cycle of good and evil. But when you stop thinking about the good and evil, when you stop sinning and you focus on life and abundant life and a relationship with God, that's when you have fulfillment. That's when you have kingdom. That's when you have the manifestation of real and abundant life, not through following rules, but through living and giving thanks. 
And we focus on Adam and Eve and saying, how could they make that decision? You make that exact same decision every single day. Every single day you wake up, you have a choice. What are you going to live for? Are you going to live to try and be a good person in this world? Or are you going to try and live in relationship with creation and create and cultivate? The same thing God did. If we're made in the image of God, the one thing we know about God for sure is that he created. So shouldn't it be my call to be the salt and the light of the earth, to create, to add value to it? And it's through doing that and letting the inspiration and the imagination that God blesses us with as the, the funnel that goes from our minds into the world. And then we steward that blessing and that treasure and that creation. And we love other people and we love nature and we love our enemies. And we do things that the world tells us we shouldn't do. It's when we do that, that's when we get the most love back. And that's when we have the most fulfillment. And Jesus paved that way. You know, Jesus is the one who connected those, the, the power supply with the power line after it was broken down. And what Jesus means more than just a salvation and a savior is it's the reconciliation of the relationship between God and man. And it's that reconciliation that can now take me from a broken person who has no hope, who has no potential, who has no power, and turn me into an all-powerful, supernatural being because of faith, because of God, because of my creative powers that God has blessed me with, because of the fruit of the Spirit. And John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believe in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, if we believe in, God, in, in Jesus, we have to listen to His teachings. What did Jesus say? Number one rule, love God as you love yourself. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> love God and love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's three things you gotta love. God your neighbor, and yourself. And you to love yourself, you have to understand that you are capable of doing anything. You are empowered through God to do things that nobody has done before. To break the rules, to break the box, to be uniquely you, and to do amazing things. You have to believe that you can, because God has called you to do it. And it's through loving Him and loving yourself that you can then love other people. And you know, Christ says that God is love. And what is it to love? My grandfather, before he passed home, he said, love is simple. Love is respect and love is sacrifice. If you love someone, no matter who they are, your enemy, someone who's poor, someone who's rich, you respect them. The second thing you do is you sacrifice for them. Now, I respect and love God so much, I'm going to sacrifice my life for Him. And I'm going to sacrifice my life for other people. I expect the same thing from anyone else because it's so fun. Like really, like life is so good. Every single day is, a, is so fun, like a blessing. Like I see things happen, miracles every single day, as long as I look towards them. Christ said, don't worry. He said, you know, if the eye is unhealthy, then the whole body can't see because the light comes through the eye. The question is, what are you focusing on? If you look at the world through the lens of the earth, and you focus on money, you'll never be happy. But if you look at it through the lens of heaven, and then you say, how do I manifest heaven on earth? The same thing that we pray in the Lord's Prayer, that's where real life comes. You can't serve God and money, because they're opposite. You don't need money. You don't need fame. You don't need success. But you need God. Because without Him, you have nothing. So, above everything, I want people to know that when they look at my life and they see anything that I do, like I'm not doing this because like, I want to do it. I'm not doing this so that I can be known. I'm not doing this because I have a cool idea that I want to start. I'm doing this because God has blessed me with the opportunity to have life. And I am called to be the salt and light in the situations I am put in. And if God put me here in, in Lynchburg, Virginia or in Nassau, Bahamas, I'm going to do the most that I can do with what I've been blessed with to love every single person I've been put in the stewardship of knowing and meeting. That may be through business, that may be through nonprofit work, that may be through a conversation, but above everything, it begins and it ends with love. And that's what I want people to know.